All right, check out this botched mess. The floor gets some latex treatment over the concrete, over the foundation, and your drywall, and that 36 inch door. And uh, that will lead into the bay main studio room that I will be doing all the mixing. This is an ISO booth with an omnidirectional microphone in there currently, but it will be used for mostly guitar recording. The centerpiece of the entire studio, while I wish I had the kind of skill to make a case like this, it was made by EMC, or EuroRackModularCase.com, which is a company run by two gentlemen, and one of them is this guy Brock, who makes absolutely brilliant cases. He is a genius woodworker, and he puts so much love and care into his designs, and he made this modular case knowing that your arms need somewhere to go when you're patching, and I never realized that until I sat down in front of it. The case itself was inspired by David Gilmore's The Blue, and you can see why. I paid full price for this case, and I still think that I got a good deal, so this isn't so much of a plug as it is a recommendation. These guys make beautiful custom studio furniture. The east side of the room is never going to be finished, it's always going to be a little project side, and right now that project is getting a live set together for February 22nd. Above that you can see a mini split HVAC system which provides heat and AC and dehumidification for the entire studio. Beneath the sound isolating boards, you can see the servers, the RAID drives, all the guts. Ultimately, I have a crowded yet roomy situation where all of the vital things that I usually use to produce music are constantly around me. In case something ever does go wrong with the HVAC in here, I have a second opinion alongside a nest so I can keep things nice and comfortable for me and my comrade. And finally, while it is anything but pretty, I have a fully functional half bath and it works wonderfully. Hi there, after I made my last video announcing that I would be taking a bit of a break to build a recording studio, I decided not to shave until I was 100% done. Oh, I think I am done with this place. And over the last couple months, I've gotten quite a few questions on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And I decided to just sort of consolidate them and answer them in one video. And so that's what this video is. Isolation and soundproofing. What sort of materials are you using? Also, any recommends of companies that sell good material like rock wool, etc. For sound isolation, meaning to isolate the sound down here so it cannot be heard upstairs and to isolate sound upstairs so it cannot be heard down here, I am using rock wool safe and sound, uh, which is pretty cheap. I mean, you could get at Home Depot. It's not cheap when you buy a whole bunch of it, which I did. And every 16 inches, you know, I have ply, in the floor upstairs and then I have uh, every 16 inches you have a beam and in those beams I have two each so this is just caked with that shit and the stuff's kind of nasty too I feel like I was breathing it in even though it's apparently non-toxic but it's uh, apparently really really fireproof as well hence the safe and uh, yeah it works really really well another soundproof hack that I found I actually talked about in the last video before I start all this is silverboard. I have some of that right back there out of focus. Silverboard wrapped with speaker fabric. And I have that on the walls in select places. And silverboard is one of those strange things where it actually isolates sound decently well. However, it's not very heavy because generally the heavier something is, the better it isolates sound. And uh, silverboard is pretty light. So that's, a it's working very well. Also, was it a fully solo effort or did you have any help? Is it worth hiring someone to help you do it right? I hired three different people for three different things. I hired a man named Knox, who is an older handyman who used to build houses, and he helped me raise a wall after taking the arch down. 
and Knox was uh, very expensive, and he wasn't the most efficient worker in the world, but he had a world of knowledge in his head, and that's why I hired him. I didn't really need him there. I know how to, I, I can figure out the drywall, I can figure out the raising the wall, all that stuff, but I had a million questions. A great example is door jams. If you don't know what a door jam is, just search door jam, J-A-M-B, in Google, and uh, you'll see images of a door jam, and then you'll say, oh yeah, I have a bunch of those. I changed my mind a few times, and I made some slight math errors, so I had to cut my door jams quite a few times, and I was just using a standard hacksaw, so naturally, I went to Google, and I searched, and I found, oh, they make jam saws. Okay, that's really helpful. And I can also rent an electric jam saw or buy an electric jam saw from Home Depot. And I told Knox, I have to get a jam saw because hacksawing these jams are just awful. And he said, ah, get a Japanese pull saw. And I said, okay, why? And he said, well, just because you pull and then bring it out, pull, bring it out. And I was like, how is that more efficient? And he was like, it just is. That's what I use for door jams. And I was like, okay. So I bought a Japanese pull saw. And holy shit, it got really, really easy to do these jams. Like it was incredibly easy and I saved a whole bunch of money. So by hiring Knox, who I buggered incessantly every second he was here asking questions, um, I probably saved more money than what I paid him because he seemed to have a little answer for everything. One thing that I learned is that this home improvement and renovation work isn't so much about your skill, it's so much about knowing what tool does what. And that actually is something that you either learn with time or you learn from a man like Knox. I hired a plumber to hook up the toilet and sink. And the only reason I did this is because if something goes wrong, uh, my insurance will probably ask me, well, who installed it? And if I say me, then they'll say, well, then we're not covering it. But if I say, oh, this licensed plumbing company did it, then they'll cover it. That's the only reason I hired him. Hiring that plumber cost me about $1,000 for something I could have done in half the time. And it sounds arrogant to say that, but he would even agree with me. He had only been a plumber for a couple months and he just worked for a company and he just did a terrible job. And I even pointed out some things about like the way where pipes were angled and he had to come back. I made him come back on Christmas Eve and he made good on it. And he came back on Christmas Eve and helped me uh, angle these pipes correctly. So I don't just have sewage water sitting around, but that was kind of a big disaster. And if it wasn't for the insurance thing, I would have never hired him. And I kind of wish that I didn't have to. He was a really nice guy, but he didn't know what the fuck he was doing. The third was for HVAC. I went on thumbtack.com, which is a site where you could type your little project and then a bunch of people will uh, give you their estimate on it. And it's probably terrible for the contractors. Thumbtack probably takes way too much money. It's also just kind of weird to, I, I feel for them because it's kind of weird for them to uh, have to give you an estimate without actually being there and looking at all the details. So I supplied as many pictures and descriptions as I can, but it was kind of a unique request because I said, hey, I am installing a mini split HVAC system. I intend on hammer drilling through the foundation of my basement and I need someone to generally just be around telling me what I'm doing wrong if I do something wrong and inspecting it afterwards. So to answer your question, is it worth hiring somebody to help you do it right? Uh, one of the guys, I was just picking his brain. That's the only reason I hired him. And uh, two of the guys was generally for insurance. Uh, again, if something went wrong with the plumbing, I want my insurance to, you know, have a plumber on the other end of that. And also with the HVAC, uh, Richard Devine told me a horror story about his mini split turning into a waterfall. So I wanted to make sure I did it right over there too. And I wanted to make sure that my insurance would cover it. I see myself as about average intelligence. And I don't think that anything that I did here was outside of my realm of understanding. I do have a bit of previous experience with woodworking, but nothing crazy, nothing I've ever woodworked would be considered great woodworking or something that you would behold. It was like, oh, I need a chair or I need a table or I need something to hold the synthesizer and then I go make it. If I got a piece of Ikea furniture and if it just had one graphic that showed all of the parts with little arrows showing where they go, just everything sort of exploded in how it works, then I wouldn't need to look at the instructions. I would actually prefer that and then just do it my way now that I know what goes where, if that makes any sense. That's how uh, proficient I am at this crap. Books like this are just that, and they, they sort of help explain stuff. So if there's something that is a bit of a mystery, like how does this work, I don't know what I'm doing, you look at that and you're just kind of like, oh, 
oh, that's genius, okay, and then you just do it. My point with all of this is that I think that if you are an able-bodied adult, I think that you can do pretty much the same level quality of job that I did here. Finally, if you just call up a plumbing company or an HVAC company, the going rate for your project is as much as you are willing to pay. The plumber guy I called initially quoted me at three grand, and I just said, oh, okay, I'll just hire somebody else, and then he was like, okay, well, I could probably make it work for 2200 and I said, no, I'll just do it myself, man. It's not that big of a deal. And he's like, okay, well, 1700 I got him down to like a thousand bucks. It's really, really deceptively easy to throw money away on a contractor. The ceiling in our studio sucks. The audio gets trapped up there and just muds everything up. I realize yours is a basement, so you don't have to deal with tall ceilings. But do you have any good ideas to lower the ceiling, so to speak? It's about 4 to 4.5 meters up, so it's not exactly easy to mount stuff up there. I am using heavy foam acoustic ceiling tiles in here, and it works brilliantly. And you're probably thinking, I wish I could use heavy foam acoustic ceiling tiles. And you can, you can just hang a ceiling. Um, just get some wire, hang a grid, put foam ceiling tiles in there. Or uh, you don't even need to hang a grid if you don't want to. If you, if you could have sound foam and you could just hang that wire, you could hang the sound foam directly if you wanted to do it that way. Um, that would probably be cheaper. I've seen a lot of studios that do that before. They have wire that comes down and then they just sort of hang the foam right above the area where they're mixing things. There is a chance that the audio could bleed out and still get trapped up there, but you could put some of, for example, the silver board with the speaker wire around it as shields and kind of prevent that from happening. That's probably the first thing that I would try. My 128 gigabyte memory card just ran out and I realized that this entire time I had been accidentally recording in cropped 4K. Did you have fun? What was the most important thing that you learned? Smiley face. Did I have fun? No. I didn't. I don't think there was any particular part of this that was fun other than the learning things. Uh, I think learning is fun, uh, personally, and I learned a whole bunch. I learned just about everything that there is to know about how a house works, which is really awesome, and when nobody listens to my music anymore, it will probably come in handy uh, when I become a handy man. I think the most important thing that I learned is that even if you are looking up a DIY project and it says that it is, you know, a difficult level job, um, that doesn't mean difficult. That means difficult as in it's just going to be a lot of labor and a lot of work. Meaning that unless you have grave consequences for screwing something up, I think that looking at any project and thinking, I can't do this, I need to hire somebody else, is insulting yourself. I think that you absolutely can do it. I feel like throughout this entire video, I'm going to be pushing this self-motivation, you can do anything narrative, but it really is true. And if you want to be safe, let's say you are installing a toilet, save up the money that you are estimated to pay to have that toilet installed, and then do it yourself. And if you screw it up, then hire a plumber to come out and uh, finish the job. Very interested in your wiring process, analog wiring, in wall wiring, isolated electrical. Do you have or have you considered audio over IP? One thing I spent a lot of time considering and debating was balanced power. Uh, for example, in your house, in any place that's not a recording studio with balanced power, you have a hotline, um, a, uh, a line that's hot, uh, or sometimes people call it a load. <laughs> I, I wired this entire house and never realized any of this and now in front of a camera I say it out loud and my 12 year old brain kicks in. In a normal North American household coming from your box just for a standard outlet you have one line that's 120 volts that's usually the color black. You have a white line that is usually your neutral and then you have a ground which is green or bare. Balanced power doesn't have a neutral so the ground can never actually loop and you have a ground between 260 volts wires. If you're wiring a standard studio, it could be converted to balanced for about $1,000. I chose against it for the simple reason that I do not plan on living in this house until I die. I probably will live here for five more years and then sell it. This is actually kind of an investment property. And then I will move into a different house where I will go through this entire process again. Also, are you isolating your climate control? I saw the vid with the humidifier, but I don't remember how you are setting and regulating temperature. Thanks. The biggest mistake I made with this project was climate control being sort of an afterthought. Uh, this basement is hooked up to the central AC and heat, 
And so I just installed some quiet vents in the ceiling, which I'm now not using at all because I decided to install a mini split where I have my own temp temperature control, humidity control. If you don't know what a mini split or multi-level split AC heat system is, look it up because they're actually quite efficient and they work great and they're not that expensive and they're super, super quiet. I still have the dehumidifier in case I absolutely need it, but they're really loud. Dehumidifiers are essentially air conditioners that don't actually blow out cold air. So they're, you get the heat end of the air conditioner that usually goes outside. And so you have a space heater that's really loud, that's sucking water out of the air, and they're not efficient at all. My first consideration was getting an industrial grade dehumidifier in the garage where I would have the return and the vent in here. And so just basically always suck air out and then return it dry. It would have taken a ton of power. There'd be noise coming out of the vents and it would raise the overall noise floor of the studio. And worst of all, in the summer on a 90 degree humid Georgia day, it would just be putting more heat in here and it would, I it might even have diminished returns because it would put so much heat in here that it would get more humid with me in here. And then it just wouldn't be able to keep up and it would just run all the time. And so I ended up using the mini split instead, which so far has worked excellently. What are good ways to reduce ground noise and noise in general when working in a DAW that's receiving audio from devices through USB and quarter inch? I found a Furman surge protector that helps alleviate some of the problem, but it feels more like a band-aid than anything. Ground loops are very simple and complicated at the same time. They're very annoying when you're trying to work with audio or even trying to set up just a normal home theater system. There are plenty of websites and probably even videos explaining the science of how they work, but you probably don't wanna go that far into it. I'm gonna give you three things to try in the order of how you should try them. The first thing you should try is unplugging the coaxial network cable from the back of your cable modem because that cable has a ground in it and you have a ground in your house and they're coming from two different places creating a awful loop. If that solves it, you have the option of either using wireless internet to get rid of the ground unplugging the internet every single time that you uh, want to record something. If you want to do it the right way, you could get a ground isolator for your coaxial cable, and then you could get another adapter where you hook it into a ground rod that is already coming from your house. Uh, that's a little more complicated, but it will solve the problem and it won't diminish your internet signal. If you unplugged your internet and it didn't help your ground loop, now I want you to turn off all your gear and I want you to unplug it all and plug it all into the same receptacle through either a power strip or your Furman or anything like that. One thing that often causes a ground loop is plugging into different circuits. For example, this entire studio is in one 20 amp AFCI circuit. If that didn't work and you're absolutely desperate and you just do not feel like running a new ground pole into your circuit breaker box, uh, the thing that is kind of not the safest thing to do is to simply remove the ground from the end of a power strip and plug certain pieces of gear into that that you need to be quiet. Nobody recommends this, including myself, but I have done it quite a few times at venues that had horrible ground problems. Other than that, there seems to be a whole market of devices that claim to get rid of ground loops, but I don't really understand how any of them could possibly work if you're not actually getting rid of the ground loop that would happen far before that device came into play in your setup. What was the most expensive or time-consuming part of the build? And what was your favorite part of it? Expensive and time-consuming would be the floor because I had this concrete foundation floor that I had to put latex coating on, then I put dry core on top of that, then I put carpeting and or linoleum flooring on top of that. And so all of those things took a lot of time and a lot of money. My favorite part, when I say favorite part, I mean part that I disliked the least, and that was probably electrical. Uh, I'm already kind of familiar with the world. It's hard to really make any mistakes in how I'm running things because, you know, it's three wires. Running the ceiling lighting and the outlets and all that stuff wasn't really labor intensive. So I tended to look forward to the thing that wasn't labor intensive because I was really sore and tired from all the other stuff. How important is the location when trying to get consistent, good creative output? I don't know, to be honest, the place that I lived where I got the most work done and was the most creative was probably in a bedroom in my mom's house when I was a teenager. And so is it age? It definitely wasn't that bedroom because I couldn't work at night. Um, I had a yard that just looked into a neighbor's yard. Uh, 
I'm gonna go ahead and pretend that there are many other variables such as your general creativity and your the amount of time that you can spend being creative uh, just because I just built a studio in a basement that just looks out at some trees and I could probably think of a lot better places to be creative. I like to think that if I had this amazing recording studio that looked out through Badlands National Park and I could see miles away and I could see the storms coming in and everything else, I'd like to think that I would be insanely creative in that environment, but would I? No, I'd probably just be outside more often or I'd be, you know, distracted by bison in the distance or something like that. I, I don't know that it would actually make me more creative. It might, who knows. How and when did Yorna do DIY stuff? Uh, I did know some woodworking stuff and outside of that, the entirety of it was learned while I was doing it in this project. I definitely did read books and articles and watch YouTube videos and stuff like that, but the majority of it is common sense. What made you want to do your own studio? Well, I couldn't afford to have anybody else do it for me. Any design aesthetic influences in your studio? Nope, not really. I, I think I just, you know, look through, oh, this kind of floor looks good with this color paint and just sort of went with that. For monitor or speaker placement height, how would you suggest setting that up in relation to the rest of the room? Totally depends on the room. Can't really give advice unless I'm in the room, but uh, using your ears, generally to see what sounds the best uh, is a great start. As for monitor placement, I like being the bottom of a triangle and the monitors are pointed 45 degrees into my head at my head level. Um, some people like it a little wider, some people like it a little narrower. I feel like that's usually good for me. Do you have any recommendations on good chairs for your workstation sessions? I'm 6'8", and I know you're also pretty tall from when I've met you at shows, so I'd be interested in your preferences on what helps you avoid an achy back. I have one of those little lumbar pillows that I use at the bottom of my chair. Other than that, um, I just kind of have an achy back all the time. I once bought an expensive plus size computer chair that was made just for hospital use, meaning it was made for a fat nurse to be constantly getting up and down in, and I thought that that would last forever. And it really did last forever, except that the fabric just, you know, went to shit within a year, and I ended up going back to the normal tall gaming chair. I, I, if you have any ideas, let me know, because I have been getting a new computer chair about every six months my entire life. What would you do differently if you were to build another studio? Down here in this project, I think I probably would have painted these walls instead of putting paneling on them. And because uh, I think the paneling was a waste of money because it's all being covered with sound foam anyway, but there's no way to really know that until I was already done. And uh, most importantly, I wouldn't have thought of ventilation in HVAC as sort of an afterthought. I would have thought about that first and I would have actually read up on it and read how things are supposed to ventilate because uh, I had to do that last and things were already kind of nice looking when I was uh, hammer drilling through the foundation of the house in this room. Mic placement to achieve optimum recording quality. It depends on the player, the microphone, the preamp, the instrument, the room, so many different things, uh, even the style that you want. For example, I have a preamp, I have an Alesis preamp and dynamic mics that works great for drums. It's terrible for voice or guitar or anything else. Uh, I have microphones that work for certain things and I have placements that work for certain things. That literally every single time you record anything, uh, you want to try out every possible placement that seems right to you and then go with what you like the best. How did you learn how to build? It's a very handy skill. Was it through video tutorials or a job? I found that like 50% of video tutorials on YouTube are crap. They're just awful and they tell you things that don't actually apply or they don't go into certain detail that they should go into. And so be very careful with that. I did read a whole lot for about six months before even starting this. Seems like every time I sat down at my table to have a meal, I was reading some book on some sort of trade that has something to do with home improvement. Uh, but ultimately, I think once you understand how things go together, how things work, or how pipes are run in your walls or anything like that, uh, the rest is common sense. Was there anything you wanted to implement but couldn't due to space, skill, or budget? Budget-wise, absolutely. Um, I could think of a million things I would want to implement had I, uh, you know, won a Grammy last night, but uh, I don't really have that much money. So one of them being just being in a basement is bad in general. Like you don't get much natural light, you get a lot more humidity, things like that. Um, but, you know, 
It's my house, I had a basement, and I built a basement studio because that's what I could afford. As for skill, I think that I just told myself I'm gonna try everything, and if I screw it up, I'll pay somebody to fix it, and I, it all worked out pretty well with that. Uh, as far as space, I think I'm pretty much perfect. I really, really would like to have a piano in here. That would be nice. I don't really have the space for a grand piano. I might have the space for an upright if I really make it work, but I need to save up some money to uh, afford a new one. Um, all my other pianos are left in Chicago. Do you separate electric circuits for everything sound related and another for everything else? AKA lights and stuff. Yes, uh, everything sound related is going through one receptacle and then it doesn't really need to. I have other things on that circuit, but just right now, just to keep it simple, it's going through one AFCI receptacle, which goes into one 20 amp AFCI breaker. The lights uh, in here, I mean, the lights are obviously hooked up to their own lighting circuit. All the outlets on that wall and this wall back here are on a different circuit that I could use for anything from charging a phone to uh, vacuuming or anything like that. How much time did you spend actually planning and making plans before getting to it? I'm the type of person who goes into SketchUp or even Cinema 4D and 3D models something entirely before even, you know, putting a saw to a piece of wood. And I stopped doing that recently because every single time that I did it, the process project would turn out entirely different than what I designed because in reality you think of ideas while you're working on things or you think of different ways that you could cut things or, or different ways you could paint things or ways to save time or ways to make things stronger. All of these things change once you're actually physically holding them. So I didn't plan this out that much. I had some general ideas of what I wanted and then I'd go to the store and see what was available and then I'd build it. And I think that it worked out just fine. And I'm sure that had I designed this the way that I used to design things, you know, down to a T where every single thing was 3D rendered first, I'm sure it would probably still look like it did now. And that would have been a bunch of time wasted. That being said, like I mentioned in another question, I spent about six months reading just generally how houses work, how construction works, how all these things work. Is it really bad to smoke with your synths next to you? A lot of people talk about non-smoker studios when they are selling instruments. It makes me want to look up if smoke actually damages electronics or super sensitive circuits. I can't really imagine that it would in any level of moderation. What smoke does do is it makes white things turn a nasty yellow yellow color. And I can imagine that if somebody, if you had a bunch of people chain smoking constantly around a piece of gear, it could cake up on the circuits and cause a short circuit or something like that, or uh, even at a bar or something like that. I think the reason most people list something as a non-smoking studio is because you kind of have a guarantee that you don't have any cosmetic effect from the smoke. As somebody who is a nicotineless vapor, and I just like the flavors, um, Fog machines use the same stuff, propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. And if you've ever been to a venue that constantly uses fog machines, you can feel on the speakers and on other things that it gets kind of sticky and nasty. I can see that affecting electronics too. And I've definitely noticed when vaping in my car without rolling the windows down, which is something I did when I first started vaping, uh, I realized that my windows needed cleaning constantly. So the stuff does stick around and fortunately it's pretty well ventilated in here now. So I don't have to worry about it floating around like it is now after I blew that cloud. Um, but you kind of do just want good ventilation no matter what just because good ventilation is good for you. So I have a little amateur studio at my home and every few weeks the cables are just a mess. How do you approach cable management in your new studio? I have some composer and musician friends who can't work unless everything is absolutely clean. My girlfriend, for example, can't work unless every surface is clean of anything that doesn't have to do with what she's immediately doing. A lot of people are like that. I'm kind of the opposite. I just explode all over everything on a project and then clean it all up at the end. So I don't mind having cables running everywhere when I'm working. And that's great if you're into modular synths because cables are running everywhere. I just don't mind it. And I actually feel more comfortable uh, being in a huge cluttery mess if as long as that mess has something to do with the project I'm working on, even if it's related in some other way, like, oh, I might use that since I hooked it up over here and I have a MIDI cable running grub that's not long enough, so it's running over my lap. I can actually deal with that. However, cables do need to be stored, so uh, here's a picture of how I generally store cables, and I also hang them a bit uh, now by the modular. I have just my eighth inch cables hung, which uh, 
seems to work pretty well. Cable ties obviously work well. I use reusable cable ties and those are pretty handy. However, if for example, I have like, okay, here's a MIDI cable uh, and some ins and outs and power for my MPC. I'm gonna cable tie it. Um, all the way down so it's just one big line and it doesn't get messy. Within a week, I'm taking that stuff apart anyway and I'm putting in a different line or something like that. So it's just a uphill battle. What goes into planning this kind of project? Mostly thinking about planning rooms if the question is too broad. The way that sound travels had a, it probably took the first precedent. Like, okay, I wanna be in a place that doesn't have a bedroom directly upstairs. I uh, wanna be in a room that's not too long. I wanna be in a room where sound isn't going to be going back and forth that much. In a square room like this one, this one's, this mixing room is 16 by 12 feet. In a square room like this one, sound kind of goes back and forth a lot, which is why there's so much uh, foam everywhere. I think beyond that, unless you're wealthy, you're just heavily limited to what you already have. Do you now own more tools or more gear? I have a two car garage and I would say 70% of it is tools. However, I just own a lot more gear. How important is proper lighting in contrast to, let's say, styling around with hue lights? Because when I saw your studio, I was like, and now apply the 90s neon color scheme. I don't like Philips hue lights so much because they have to have that central controller, which is like another wireless frequency that could not go through a wall somewhere or something like that. Um, I use the TP-Link CASA ones, and uh, I really dig those. Uh, they don't need a central hub. They work directly to your Wi-Fi. They update the firmware constantly. They work with Google Assistant and Alexa and Home Assistant, if you're into that, having the little Raspberry Pi thing. Those are great. I think it is important to have lights that change uh, frequencies. I think by saying by frequency, I may have gotten a little too scientific there. What I'm saying is while it might be cool to have a bulb that can turn green and purple and things like that, uh, what is important is having a bulb that can go from daylight color to warm color. Having uh, blue in your light is actually pretty important for your circadian rhythm. What is mandatory to have in studio monitors? Uh, I think just as long as all the frequencies that you can hear are covered, which is, you know, depending on how old you are, uh, could go anywhere up to 22,000 hertz. Um, I think that as long as you have that covered and if you're comfortable with your monitors, uh, I think that's all that matters. A lot of people are going to disagree with me on that. Uh, a lot of my friends have $5,000 Genoex systems. I use Yamaha H8, uh, the old school ones. I have repurchased used ones when ones have died because that's just what my ears are used to. And I use a KRK sub with those eight inch H8s. And that's just what my ears like. I've tried Gentle X, I've tried more expensive systems and I just really like the ones that I'm used to. I realize that at some point I may have to upgrade because the world is going to run out of uh, those first run H8s. Uh, and that's just something that I'm gonna have to eventually deal with and get my ears tuned to a different speaker. So clearly I'm a little quirky with that and a lot of professionals would probably disagree with me. So maybe don't take my advice on that. Say something about gear acquisition syndrome. I don't know what to say about it. It definitely exists. Uh, I think the last study I read was a European study and something like 30 to 40 percent of Europeans uh, had some form of moderate level lack of economic self-control and I assume Americans might actually be a little worse with that and that's a real thing shopping addiction is a real thing as well uh, when you buy something you get that little feeling of dopamine and then buying something is incredibly easy you don't actually have to work for it you could just go to Target and buy a bunch of crap and bring it home and uh and you feel good about yourself when you're doing it and you get home and then you have that guilt because you spent a bunch of money on crap that you didn't need. And that's why those stores exist, like Walmart and Target, those big box stores where you could go in and you could say, okay, I, all I need right now is a new furnace filter. And you go in there and you end up with like, you know, new bed sheets and some stupid board game and a DVD, even though you don't even have a DVD player anymore. And you're just like, well, how did I do that? And they're very well tuned to uh, hacking that shopping addiction that 
all of us have a little bit. Gear acquisition syndrome, uh, I would imagine, is just shopping addiction on meth because you're buying an audio or photography related piece of gear. And those are the two areas where I've heard gear acquisition syndrome be referred to. And you're buying uh, something that is related to your dream. You feel like you're investing in your dream because your dream job is to be a professional musician or a professional photographer. Or you already are and you feel like you're making an investment into an already somewhat or very lucrative career. So the dopamine rush is a little bit higher and the guilt is a little bit lower. And so I assume that's probably what gear acquisition syndrome is. Uh, I feel like a lot of this has to do with the economic class that you were in when you were a kid or growing up or a young adult. There were points in my younger life, uh, not as a child, but as a young adult, where I couldn't eat and I shoplifted food and I had to shoplift to eat. So my diet was limited to things like chips and things I could steal from 7-Eleven. Um, which didn't last long, fortunately. But I think that that does put a lot of things into perspective because I always sort of think how many pieces of fruit could I buy instead of buying this piece of a pro audio gear. I don't have any official studies on hand to cite and I'm not an economist, so I'm just speaking from my own experiences. But the first time I got a huge check, I was, uh, I was probably making like 12,000 a year and then I got a check that was uh, in the low six figures and it was the first time I'd ever seen any type of money like that and it didn't even make sense to me. It was just like, this is so much money, I don't know what to do. Um, and I bought shoes. I bought a lot of new shoes. That's what I did with it. So I think it'd be safe to say that people in general need to understand how to manage money better. I have a rule with tattoos. Uh, I wanted a big tree on my arm and I waited a year after deciding that I wanted a big tree on my arm to actually go to a tattoo artist and get it. Same thing on this arm. I wanted something relating to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because I had been involved with it for many, many years. And I still waited a year after designing this tattoo to have a tattoo artist put it on my arm. And I feel like that would be a great thing to practice with any sort of audio device that costs more than $100. Maybe not a year, but maybe two weeks. For example, I want a new electronic drum kit. And if I had the money to spend on one right now, I personally would probably wait a month and then ask myself, do I still want that new electronic drum kit and then buy one? Or I would have, you know, saved the money or done something else with it. So I think giving yourself time, making a rule where you give yourself time before you waste money on gear would be a uh, great idea. Another good rule would be not to pre-order anything. Never buy something unless it's already on the market and people, and, and this is everything from video games to, uh, to electronic devices to gear. Um, I, the only one exception is my albums. You should always pre-order those. I definitely consolidated some questions and I apologize that if I left anything out, I'm definitely happy to be done with this and I thank you for taking interest in it and asking the questions. If you are in the Southeast, I will be playing a show on February 22nd with Bleep Bloop at, uh, what is the name of the venue? At Terminal West in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been slacking a lot on the playing live thing and I plan to definitely get back into it this year. Also, if you're into my music, I have two new tracks on two different compilations on two different record labels, now on Spotify. And they should be in my latest releases column there. And they're also available on iTunes and Bandcamp and pretty much everywhere you could get music. Now that all this is done, I should be more active. So thanks for watching. And if you like this video, subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comments if there's anything you want me to cover in the future. Bye.